Tuesday is the last talk of the quarter in the IHC's Social Security's public event series. And it is a very fitting culmination because the work of our speaker, as you will see, makes an important intervention into our ongoing conversation about contemporary insecurity and social justice. Julie Z is professor and the founding chair of the American Studies Department at UC Davis. She's also the founding director of the Environmental Justice Project for UC Davis's John Muir Institute of the Environment. She's written three books, Noxious New York, The Racial Politics of Urban Health and Environmental Justice, which won the John Hope Franklin Publication Prize, awarded to the best published book in American Studies. Fantasy Islands, Chinese Dreams and Ecological Fears in an Age of Climate Crisis, and her most recent edited collection, Sustainability, Approaches to Environmental Justice and Social Power, which appeared in July of 2018 with NYU Press. She received her BA from UC Berkeley and her doctorate from American, uh, in American Studies from NYU, and her research investigates environmental justice and environmental inequality, culture and environment, race, gender, and power, and urban community health and activism. Her work has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the American Studies Association, the American Association of University, University Women, and the UC Humanities Research Institute. She also works in collaboration with environmental scientists, engineers, social scientists, humanists, and the community-based organizers on a wide range of research projects in New York, China, and California, here where her outputs have had an impact on social policy. And she is deeply committed to public scholarship and to the project of preparing the next generation of global citizens. She speaks and lectures widely at universities, but also at institutions such as the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art, the New York Academy of Medicine, as well as at state agencies, service organizations, and with community groups. She is also a mentor for first generation and low income students in graduate education, and she has a long history of involvement with UC's President's Postdoctoral Fellowship Program. Please join me in welcoming Julie Z to the IHC to speak on environmental justice as freedom. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, and thank you for the invite um, to Aaron for um, your help with, with, um, with many things. Um, Miroslava, um, Lisa Park, uh, some of my other colleagues here at the campus, um, especially David Pello. Um, and uh, my colleague David Correa, um, who gave me invaluable feedback from this work. Um, and I want to uh, just uh, tell you as context, this is the first time I'm giving this talk. Um, and so uh, I had an hour, and I decided to spend it with um, Professor Jia Ching Chen, who I went to undergrad with at UC Berkeley. So if it's a little rough, it's because I chose uh, uh, to talk to my friend. And we were both student activists um, at Berkeley 20 plus years ago. And so, and I was just talking to Ines, um, a professor uh, here as well, and we were talking about how um, students um, are the only thing that are sort of, let, you know, giving us um, hope in the moment. And so this uh, talk comes out of these kind of contexts. Um, and so, you know, again, for those of you who are student activists, those of you who are students, you know, this is, um, this is the uh, book that, that I, uh, feels like the most urgent for me now. And I was telling, Inez, versions of this talk were really focused before the last couple of years around violence, environmental violence, and death and extraction. And um, it got to the point where I just couldn't, couldn't, I, you know, you have to write it, you have to face it, you have to reckon with it. But there's, um, there's a point at which, you know, you can't always talk about like what death and destruction um, are doing to you psychically. You know, so that I tried to reframe um, the work as um, a freedom, environmental justice as a freedom movement. Uh, um, because I think that that's what environmental justice movements um, do. Um, and that's their value. And that's why it's important that we talk about them in that term. Um, so that's the context before I even start. So, okay, let's start here. Um, for those of you who 
know this song. Uh, it is one of my favorite songs, absolutely, in the world. And uh, I, I think you should listen to it if you haven't already. This is Stevie Wonder, um, his song Saturn from 1975. And when Stevie dies, I don't, I don't know what, what's going to happen um, to me, to many people. But the opening of the song um, says, packing my bags, going away to a place where the air is clean on Saturn. There's no sense to sit and watch people die. We don't fight our wars, you do. We put back all the things we use. On Saturn, there's no sense to keep on doing such crimes. Um, unclean air, violence, war, and consumerism that he highlights in his songs um, are wrapped in an extraterrestrial longing for a world better than Earth on Saturn. Um, four decades later, his lyrical call is both more urgent and ever distant. In a nation where rapacious corporate capitalism is plundering natural resources, oil and gas interests fund climate change denial and control what passes for environmental policy, this world with clean air and without war, rampant consumerism and extractive capitalism seems nearly impossible to imagine. But it is in this context that imagination and action become newly essential. So this um, talk comes from a book uh, that's coming out in the fall, fingers crossed, uh, called Environmental Justice in a Moment of Danger. And I really wanted to call it Environmental Justice is Freedom, but they were telling me, you know, this, I don't know, the negativity will sell better. I don't know why they wanted it. <laughs> Actually, because I changed the, top, the title, and they were like, well, we already did the mock-up with this, and so, I said, fine, I'll just leave it. Um, and so this book is part of a series called American Studies Now, Critical History of the Present. And these are short, synthetic, um, teachable American Studies, Ethnic Studies, Gender Studies, the cakes of um, the world around us. So they're definitely worth uh, checking out the series. The Barbara Ransby's Making All Black Lives Matter is the last book that came out. Um, Lisa Dugan, the editor of the series, has a book uh, called Mean Girl about Ayn Rand. You know, so there are books about trans, uh, student activism, and so on. So the idea is that these are sort of short, teachable um, texts where uh, the critical work we do as scholars can sort of exist in the world. You know, and for those of you who don't know American studies, um, it's it's not a it's not a like Trumpist major <laughs> or field. Um, it is a, a counter Trump kind of field. It comes out of ethnic studies and social movements. So um, the idea is that American studies scholars you know, uh, have a strong tradition of scholar activism and that the work we do can kind of exist in the world. Um, so that, this is the context for the book. Um, so what is this moment of danger? Uh, we are living in a precarious moment with the warmest years ever recorded, active assaults on the disenfranchised and on institutions that serve the public interest and global inequality at its zenith. This moment demands, then, an analysis from the crossroads, which is an important structuring um, moment um, in American studies. And so for those of you, you know, who know the story of the bluesman Robert Johnson, um, he cut his deal with the devil down at the crossroads. Um, and so you know, if, if any of you are American studies um, people, you, you have heard this American studies um, at the crossroads, American studies um, has at a, um, in a moment of danger. That was the name of George Lipsitz's book in the late 90s. Um, and so this idea um, that I'm playing with is that we're at a new, but actually old, uh, crossroads and moment of danger. Neoliberalism, as you all know, idealizes markets and capital and consumer subjectivities and, and values um, over that of communitarian notions of justice um, or belonging. We have lived and died under neoliberalism for at least three decades, um, but under changing conditions. So the neoliberalism in the like early 90s um, is not the same as it is now. Um, the valorization of, of privatization, finance, and the market, and the retrenchment of the state and public sectors is both paradoxically dominant and under stress. As one scholar writes, the present economic crisis is a moment of potential rupture because ideology under crisis can be legitimized or, weak, or weaken prevailing regimes of power, profit, and privilege. And one of the things I've always struck by, uh, for those of us who are a little bit older, um, is that you know, you're, if you're a young person, your probably entire lives have been <coughs> under the shadow of neoliberalism. Um, and so for those of us who we can kind of remember a different moment, and I don't mean this as a, like, a pre-lapse Syrian, like everything was great before. Um, at the same time, I think that perspective um, matters. Um, so we have to understand what is happening now within this sort of longer trajectory. 
anti-immigrant sentiments, nationalist, populist, authoritarianism, militarized security discourse, racist policies, regressive gender politics, and climate change denial or hostility are cut from the same cloth. Whether it's in the US, Hungary, the Philippines, Brazil, or Poland. Growing awareness of environmental and other injustices in the forms of vibrant social movements is also on the rise, um, in part because of the expansion of social media. Uh, I, I always like to note that you know when I started working on environmental justice in the 1990s, you kind of had to explain it, you know, like oh it's about the racial disproportionality of X, Y, and Z, and now you can just sort of say Flint or Standing Rock, you know, and there is an intuitive understanding. So there are differences; things are not the conditions are not the same. Um, although the global economic system is ever more integrated under neoliberalism, hostility to immigrants and refugees is high. Economic inequality has reached levels never seen before in any period of human history. So I mean, I'm sure you all know this, the three richest people in the US, you know, Bezos, Buffett, and Gates, own as much wealth as the bottom half of the population of the US. Globally, um, in 2013, 85 richest people in the world have a net worth of 50% of the world's planet, or 3.5 billion people. In 2017, the wealthiest 1% gained 82% 82 of the world's wealth, it was also the warmest year on record. Uh, interwoven are crises of modernity, including faith and technical authority and scientific knowledge, um, attacks on media institutions, and a winding down of the American century. I'll be a uh, bellicose American exceptionalism denying its demise through red hats and slogans. So that is a little snapshot of the moment of nature work. So the questions that I wanted to explore in this book is what, um, what crossroads of the moment are we in now? And what might we learn from environmental justice movements in our moment of danger? The argument essentially is that environmental justice are freedom, freedom struggles, and that this is a particularly significant time to reassess what environmental justice um, communities and peoples and activists have been fighting for for decades, arguably centuries, depending on when you want to periodize it. Um, environmental justice is intersectional, um, and it crosses time and space. So the book begins with an observation. Those on the environmental justice front lines have been living, dying, and fighting for a very long time. The resurgence of explicit racism is unsurprising for these justice activists, who have seen their lives structured by legacies of structural domination and racist public policies. At the same time, important social movements for environmental and climate justice are mobilizing large numbers of people, um, and that can include digitally as well. Um, and so there's a broad impact of these movements on uh, national and global spheres um, outside of their local sites. So the oil pipeline protests at the Standing Rock Sioux Reservation, responses to mass lead poisoning in Flint, Michigan, uh, mobilizations against police killings of African Americans and other people of color, impassioned um, actions by indigenous and small island populations in the Pacific and the Caribbean in opposition to climate change, comprise just a, snap, uh, a snapshot of the hundreds of protests in the U US that have foregrounded this convergence between environmentalism and social justice. Environmental justice activists make common cause across the globe and more than the victims of environmental violence and assassination. Land defenders like Bertha Caceres in Honduras, Kensar Awiwa in Nigeria, and Chico Mendes in Brazil, all of whom like, lost their lives in the struggle against dams, oils, and forestry interests. Internationally, extrajudicial killings of those who oppose economic development and de deforestation have accelerated in recent years, with the death rate rising to, in the last four years to an average of two activists in my starting point is simple. Environmental justice movements, what they are, who is involved, and what they're fighting against, but also for, help us understand historical and cultural forces and resistance to violence, death, and destruction of lives and bodies through movements, cultures, and stories. I have a cold, so I keep on standing so sorry. Um, so the question of why now and why think of these things together? Because obviously each of these um, things you could, there's a lot you could say about Standing Rock, and there's a lot you could say about Flint, there's a lot you could say about the Central Valley. But what I'm trying to do in the book is talking about them all together and to understand why they um, kind of converge at the same moment. Um, to take this kind of approach is to say that things are related, not the same. Um, and so the book structure, um, and by putting these things together, I'm arguing, um, suggesting that environmental justice movements, they're not unique, they're justice movements more broadly, provide a soundtrack of freedom. Um, and that is the soundtrack we need to listen to. Um, it's against violence, 
you know, so it's kind of what are you against, but also it's for a sense of freedom capaciously defined. So just to give you a sense of the book structure, um, the introduction talks about American studies um, and environmental justice. Um, it explains that I'm using a bunch of keywords um, and uh, talking about social movements and the urgency of the moment. That that uh, is what I talked about before. So number chapter one is um, called this movement of movements, and the keywords are violence, and colonialism, and climate justice, gender violence, and you know the the standing rock tar sands and the um, the activist groups. You know they kind of go that. Um, chapter two looks at environmental justice, called environmental. Justice Encounters uses the keywords of privatization, predation, and radical democracy. It talks about the water um, racism and water justice movements in Flint, Michigan, and the Central Valley, and really highlights the work of the Community Water Center. Um, chapter three is called Restoring Environmental Justice, uh, engaging keywords of radical hope, solidarity, reparations, ecologies, and climate debt. Um, it talks about Hurricane Katrina as this kind of opening moment, Hurricane Maria, climate justice in Kivalina, Alaska, and uprose in New York City. And then the, the conclusion is called American Optimism, Skepticism, and, and Environmental Justice. Okay, so that's like what I'm trying to do with the book. It's a lot, obviously. Um, so in thinking of these things together, um, it's precisely in this moment that understanding environmental justice movements is essential. Um, and this moment, of course, comes from Walter Benjamin's um, thesis on the philosophy of history, when he says, to articulate the past historically does not mean to recognize it, quote, in the way it really was, but to, quote, um, seize hold of a memory as it flashes up in a moment of danger, end quote. So this book is about seizing hold of the significance of environmental justice movements in our moment of danger. The moment of crisis is a moment of, is a moment of rupture. Dominant belief systems and ideologies that dispute them come into um, sharp relief. Um, again, my focus in the book is on environmental justice social movements, the cultures and analytic they advance and embody. Environmental justice movements offer important signposts um, for troubled times because these movements and the people who make them have long-standing political commitments and have done important ideological work grounded in everyday and long-lasting struggle. It starts with the premise that environmental damages are interwoven with political and social conflict. Um, it examines how organizers, communities, and movements fight but they also survive, love, and create in the face of environmental and social violence that challenges the very conditions of life itself. Um, so, you know, there's lots of reasons why um, environmental justice in American cities are linked um, in terms of how they see things in kind of an integrated way. Environmental justice connects race, class, indigeneity, gender, and environmentalism, and fundamentally social and environmental justice. The expanding resonance of the environmental justice frame is a concrete response to intensifying and interconnected conditions of pollution and, again, inequality. Um, what I think is interesting for those of you, you know, who follow the environmental justice movement, um, David Pello, in his um, recent book, Critical Environmental Justice Study, uh, Environmental Justice, kind of reappraises the 1991 principles of environmental justice, um, sort of seeing the radical uh, frame in which they use. Um, but you can even see movement um, documents kind of, you know, foreground their worldview. And the 2002 principles of working together were guided by the central principle, quote, we need each other and are stronger with each other, end quote. Um, and so I think that this idea of interconnectedness is really central. Environmental justice was in 1991, in 2002, and now about expansion, connection, and change governed by this fundamental belief. That perspective of working with each other, that we're stronger together, um, matters more than ever as justice activists fight higher-headed assaults, attacks on immigrants and refugees, LBGTQ and abortion rights, voter suppression, and broader ret retrenchment from the gains of social movements in gender, environmentalism, and civil rights in shaping public policy, discourses, and private lives. Um, so the Basically, environmental justice is expanding, and that is a good thing. But if it's expanding, it, it, expanding without a sense of politics is also can be dangerous. So under the EPA, under President Bush, you know, he talked about environmental justice was for everyone, but that was just a mask to you know do its oil and gas um, interests. So to be absolutely clear, my starting premise is that unjust environments are rooted in racism, capitalism, militarism, colonialism, land theft of native peoples, and gender violence. Um, the status quo is too deeply invested in the institutional forces and ideological structures that exacerbate already existing conditions of environmental 
and social injustice. Tom Holtu, um, the head of the Indigenous Environmental Network, um, says very, I think, wisely, the system isn't broke, it was built this way. So I want to talk um, briefly about, um, just to talk about the Central Valley. Uh, so of all of those things, like, you know, we could talk about all of those movements and they're all important, but I, I wanted to actually focus on the Central Valley um, right now. Um, so environmental racism, um, so the next like five slides are on the Central Valley. And then maybe if I have time, I'll talk about the paper I'm working on about like canine police violence um, in Kern County. Um, so environmental racism, um, is uh, Ruth, well, Ruth Gilmore, uh, a geographer in Golden Gulag, who talks about the explosive growth of prisons in the Central Valley in the 1980s and 1990s. And she gives a really good, I think, short uh, description of, of what is happening. So racism is the, quote, state-sanctioned and or extra-legal production of group-differentiated vulnerability to premature death, um, end quote. And so I think that concept of um, group state-sanctioned and or extra-legal production um, and of uh, vulnerability to premature death is a frame that helps us understand how these issues that seem like they're really different are actually connected um, to each other. Um, so the uh, social movements, of course, um, in all of those places vary in their politics and approaches. Um, however, there are recurrent themes and threats. Um, environmental justice perspectives link um, justice to freedom, and they delink freedom with the market and freedom. Um, so let me just talk about the um, violence, environmental racism, and Pell's critical EJ um, framework. Uh, the Central Valley is a landscape of hyper um, concentration of imprisonment and also hyper concentration of pesticides and pollution. And so those things are um, connected to, to each other structurally. It's also a site of great uh, water injustice issues. Uh, one of the things in Flint, you know, that came up um, was after the mass lead poisoning and intentional cover-up by government um, agencies. Um, the community members, but not all community members, like you know, undocumented people didn't have um, rights to access the bottled water that was given to them. You know, many people, even in California, don't know that this is kind of a normalized condition of life and death in California. There are tens of thousands of people, of thousands of people in the Central Valley who have no access to clean water. You know, and who buy all of the water that they need for every purpose, you know, cooking, cleaning, showering, and so on. So there's water, um, water injustice issues. There's air issues in the Central Valley. So Bakersfield has the worst air quality in the U.S. There's oil issues. I know we're in Santa Barbara, you know, this is, you know, I think sure many of you know the oil history here as well. Kern is currently the highest uh, producing oil um, county in California. Um, so the spaces of confinement and social control um, are connected. You know, if you look at those things as separate, you will miss part of the story. And this is, I think, um, Pelos the, the importance of his critical environmental justice um, framework. Uh, Ruth Gilmore, you know, basically argues that prisons are a, a spatial and a racial fix to crisis. Um, the, the crisis of um, sort of overproduction and race uh, in the 1980s and 1990s. Um, there's also, as I was telling you, I'm working on this paper on police racism right now. So um, Kern County has the highest per capita kill rate um, by the police, um, and including a use of um, canines and dogs in a, in a, in a pretty uh, horrific way. Um, including, you know, setting dogs on people who have already been under control, um, setting dogs on people for traffic stops, uh, setting dogs on people, you know, who are, um, you know, not dangerous but disruptive. Almost all the people who have been killed by canines and, and under police violence more generally are um, black and Latino. Um, and so, you know, my point here is that, you know, the, these landscapes of inequality are, are um, they're deeply unequal. Um, if you look at them only as um, uh, around crime or as pesticides or as oil or air, you're going to miss the complexity of what's happening. Um, in this context, there are vibrant social movements against these conditions of death, violence, and extraction. So um, this is a woman um, named Teresa de Anda, and she um, she is a she was she died of a very rare form of cancer, um, and her family believes it was because of exposures to pesticides. 
Um, this is like, you know, the field and, you know, her home is right across. So uh, the Central Valley region of California um, is 2% of the nation's farmland and 25% of the nation's pesticides. Um, most of the pesticides are aerially applied. So, and then, and then. Um, and so it's, there have been very, very high um, profile pesticide poisoning incidents um, in the last, uh, and legislation, because of people like, you know, Teresa. Um, in the last uh, like 15 years. So, you know, again, this is not an artifact of like, you know, the 1930s, like when you read about the Bracero program and when, you know, um, migrants from Mexico were like fumigated. You know, this is like, like pretty recent. Um, and so, uh, Teresa de Anda um, was very active around um, environmental uh, pesticide drift activism. There's actually a remarkable website called Remembering Teresa, which has a lot of her stories and narratives. Um, this project, 25 Stories, came out of a master's thesis that um, I, I helped supervise from a woman named um, Tracy Perkins, who's now a professor at Howard. Um, and she uh, was really interested in a, a specific question about gender and politicization. But then she was also wanted to kind of share the stories um, of the activists that she was interviewing, um, mostly women environmental justice activists. So these women environmental justice activists who were involved in pesticides and involved in farm worker justice issues were also very organized against prison, um, prison, and prison expansion. And Ruthie Gilmore writes about this in her Golden Rule. Um, so in this, basically the point is like there's this really, really depressing, horrible, violent, you know, uh, premature vulnerability, um, vulnerability to premature death going on in the Central Valley, like in every single way. And yet, in this landscape, not there are activists who are organizing, have been organizing, have been fighting for as long as there have been those problems. Um, and I think that's the um, the freedom struggle that I'm trying to um, get people to talk about. Uh, this is another example of a water justice activist. Um, this is Sandra Mraz. So Sandra Mraz, that's she's one of the tens of thousands of people in the Central Valley who have to buy the water. Um, for their everyday life. Um, she was also the first um, community member that was named to a local water board. Um, and so, you know, for those of you, I know it's hard to believe now because it's so wet, but I mean, I, as you all know, there was a major drought and so on. And then, you know, the water issues in California are basically like, you know, the land and power. You know, whoever controls water is, you know, who has, like, life. Um, and in the Central Valley, the water districts are governed by um, who owns property, you know, not by who owns, uh, who lives, how many people live in a place. So, you know, in that context, most of the water districts are run by big ag. You know, so for Sandra Mraz to be named to a, um, the Water Justice Local Board was like a big, um, was a big deal. Um, and though down there is um, Susanna Don, no relation to Teresa, uh, who is a very big uh, water justice activist based in um, Visalia. Um, this, many of you already know this. Um, so the, the gender components of it, the idea of the body, um, these are very big and long standing um, issues. Um, in the Central Valley, but also other agricultural regions in California. Um, this is an example of a report um, that comes out of a project that uh, my colleague Jonathan London, who directs the Center for Regional Change, um, and I think what's really interesting is that they're trying to quantify what cumulative environmental vulnerability looks like and how do you measure that. So taking that idea of premature um, vulnerability to premature death and trying to kind of quantify it in a way that can be policy activated. Um, and so that's the sort of like the community um, engaged um, research that I think is really important. Um, and so the, uh, this is another uh, picture from Tracy Perkins. Um, and this was uh, the Kettleman City um, cleft palate controversy. Um, and so, for those of you who know the history of environmental justice, like some of the, kind of one of the iconic places where environmental justice direct action takes place is Kettleman City. If you've driven from San Francisco to the, um, the Bay Area, like you drive right past Kettleman City, it's like it's got this in and out, you know, what's this. The only good thing about that in and out is that the women's bathroom is like five times bigger than the men's bathroom. Like, I have no idea why. Um, 
But the Kettleman City is like a really um, active site. Uh, they have been fighting the expansion of the largest hazardous waste um, facility west of the Mississippi for since the, the 80s. Um, and so in, in uh, a few years ago, there was uh, 20, uh, out of 20 live births, um, five of them had, uh, were cleft palate births, and um, three of the children died. So um, the community was saying that this was related to their exposure, and you know, there was a lot of um, media attention and so on. They forced the state to do a study which basically said this was the finding. But you know, imagine this much more policy-oriented, but you know, I'll just like dumb it down for you. Um, there's nothing um, particularly polluted in the Pendleton City because all of the Southern San Joaquin Valley is that polluted. You know, that was the essential finding of the report. Um, and so, you know, community environmental justice activists um, really focus on the idea of cumulative risk, which is not how, like, state agencies and um, polluters think of things. You know, they think of, like, okay, well, is my thing polluting? And can you show that this thing has a direct relationship? Well, community environmental justice activists have always said that that's not the way people live in the world. You know, I don't live with this exposure and then this exposure. You know, our bodies are the site of where all this stuff is happening. And so I think, you know, the, what the activism, the, the scholar activism and the engagement with the research um, is, is what's, um, I think, important to know. You know, so that communities don't just kind of roll over and for the conditions of their, of their, you know, exploitation or death, but they fight and fight and fight and fight and fight. And I think that's what's the important part of what I'm trying to talk about. So this is a quote, you know, to, to thinking about what praxis and theory look like and the concept of, again of cumulative impacts. Pesticides, it's not just about headaches, it's not about the running nose, it's not about the watery eyes, it's not just about dizziness. Um, it's about many impacts. You know what's gonna happen to you later on, you know, it's a whole toxic. So what I think environmental justice movements do is they link justice to freedom and they de-link freedom with the market and free enterprise. Um, to do so is to reject what um, scholars Raj Patel and Jason Moore call cheap nature and the cheapening of life. So cheap nature is the foundational process and it enables the cheapening of money, work, care, food, energy, and lives. Environmental justice movements uh, reject the marketizing and cheapening of life, labor, and land. Justice movements foreground work, care, food, energy, and lives given short shrift in the, global, in the current global and economic order. Um, climate justice and environmental justice activists um, conceptualize and reframe their problems and center their lived experiences and their histories. People of color, particularly African Americans and indigenous peoples, have been made to live within environmental and bodily risk through history, including dispossession and racism. So insurgency and environmental justice as a freedom struggle can be based beyond incorporation into the world democracy or under conditions of settler colonialism. For environmental justice movements, creative, generative, and bottom-up relationships are their raison d'etre. And so too are history, art, love, and refusal. Environmental justice thus is a structured feeling, using, of course, Marxist um, cultural critic Raymond Williams. Um, he uses structured feeling to advance analysis that links the social to the personal and the theory of the social that is not just institutional or formal. Environmental justice's freedom can mean freedom from violence, um, Freedom from histories and systems that structure the present. It can mean freedom from gas, oil, and a carbon economy that trades in death and destruction. But it can also mean freedom to create and reimagine a world different from ours as the common sense. Environmental justice is more than resistance to environmental racism and colonialism. It's a set of concepts and living praxis that process time, generations, and space. Freedom is thus a capacious set of practices and ways of living in the intersecting realms of social relations, including gender, youth, and sexuality. This is more depressing stuff, but I'll get to where I want to get to in a second. So you can see, um, in moving from the Central Valley, um, I, this is from a paper that I wrote with Lindsay Dillon, which was talking about the production of, um, you know, the idea of I can't breathe, which becomes an iconic, you know, um, marker Black Lives Matter. And we were talking about Eric Garner um, and Mario Woods. Eric Garner, you know, as you know, was um, choked in New York City by the police, um, and then the coroner's report said that um, he, uh, his pre-existing conditions, like his asthma and obesity, were, were, were contributing factors in his death. And uh, my colleague, uh, Lindsay Dillon, was talking about the Mario Woods killing and kind of the politics of gentrification in San Francisco. 
So we talk about what does it mean, you know, the idea of I can breathe, like that, that sense of breathing. Um, uh, so I can't breathe extends well also well beyond police violence. It's what journalist Jamal Khashoggi actually said the same thing, I can't breathe, before his execution by the Saudi regime, uh, which is, of course, as you know, an oppressive regime based on oil. Um, if those of you who haven't seen Josh Fox's documentary, How to Let Go of the World and Love All the Things That Climate Can't Change, I highly recommend it. Um, he says pollution is oppressive, it holds you down. Um, in England's environmental racism after Superstorm Sandy in New York, oil spills in the Amazon, climate change washing away small Pacific islands, and poor air quality in Beijing. Um, and in all those cases, he um, shows how people link human rights and environmental uses. Um, he says that political oppression takes away the freedom and the joy that require, in his words, deep breath, singing, and dancing. Um, and so the inability to breathe is both a metaphor and a material reality of political oppression. Um, one of, it's a oppression, state violence, and ongoing legacies of racism. Um, two decades ago, I knew a woman, Yolanda Garcia, in the South Bronx, whose son died of an asthma attack. And she herself died of um, a heart attack at 53. Remember, Tracy Yolanda also died of cancer at that, like 55. Um, and again, thinking about, back to uh, Ruthie Gilmore's idea of um, group differentiated vulnerability to premature death. So who is basically allowed to live and who is made to die? That's what I'm interested in. Um, and so Erica Garner, Eric Garner's um, daughter, she died at the age of 27, the official reason from a heart attack triggered by an asthma episode. There were complicated issues to why, um, gender, race, maternal mortality, and structural partner violence. But the most interesting, one of the more interesting things I find about it is this resonance with the quote from um, the woman um, from the Deres Campesinas. She said, I'm struggling now with this thing, this stress and everything. This thing, it beats you down. The system beats you down where you can't win. So I think that, you know, on the one hand, thinking about violence and environmental racism is, is useful, it's powerful. It makes us um, think about how there are different pathways to action. It helps us connect diverse struggles and movements. And it helps us understand and kind of name the larger structural issues like capitalism, racism, and dispossession. Um, but I also want to think about um, the idea of, um, from Gramsci, uh, pessimism of the intellect and optimism of the will. And that is what structures my, my teaching, my outlook, and also this book. So the intellect you know, is not just a preserved pessimist. Um, and this is a quote from um, Gramsci. Too much criticism can feed despair about these end times. Oh no, this is not um, Gramsci, this is uh, Richard Johnson. Um, paralyzing the will, we need an optimism of the intellect. Um, theories and concrete studies that map out a more hopeful future, yet ground strategies and a realistic historical analysis. Perhaps we need to fine tune our political and intellectual outlook to fit today's chaotic world, and where possibilities and catastrophes coexist so intimately. We need to recover a sense of forward dreaming. <coughs> So forward dreaming is not based on delusion or naive innocence, but a politics based on values. To, although to be an optimist is to, quote, risk disappointment and the charge of foolishness, end quote, optimism, optimism is essential because of the dearth of hopeful stories about the future that, quote, express our dreams, desires, and correspond to the full range of our experience, end quote. The struggle of social movements, in, in uh, historian Robin Kelly's words, is to ask and answer, how do we produce a vision that enables us to see beyond our immediate ordeals? How do we transcend bitterness and cynicism and embrace love, hope, and an all-encompassing dream of freedom, especially in these rough times?" End quote. <clears throat> so this book, this talk, is an attempt to do that. Environmental justice struggles are a set of cautiously hopeful stories about future and freedom that we need now, especially when the very notion of future is due, due to climate change or human social freedom are under extreme stress. The optimism and the pessimism is that environmental justice movements have been fighting against authoritarianism, extractive industry, rapacious corporate capitalism, white supremacy, and government collusion for a long time. These arguments that environmental justice advocates have been making are gaining visibility and traction outside local communities. As Kelly writes, it's not enough to imagine a world without oppression, um, since we don't understand the ways in which oppression occurs, but understanding the mechanisms and processes that make them the common sense and render those processes natural or invisible. The black radical imagination is not a thing, but a process. The idea is generated from what Gramsci calls a philosophy of practice. 
It's how people in transformative social movements move and shift their ideas, rethink inherit inherited categories, and try to locate and overturn blatant, subtle, and invisible modes of domination." End quote. So, environmental justice movements, cultures, worldviews are, I think, the counter-hegemonic philosophy of practice. A search for freedom beyond local communities fighting bad environmental or regulatory systems. It's not just about state-centered policy, incorporation, or reformism, though there are obviously elements of that as well. Rather, environmental justice challenges the status quo rather than fixing or tinkering a system grounded in domination, racial terror, or colonial control. Environmental justice movements have always been about cultures of freedom through imagining and enacting solidarity, radical hope, anti-consumerism, and anti-capitalism. Populist authoritarianism, militarized security discourse, attachments to racism, regressive gender sexuality categories and policies, and petrocultures are the preserve of a dying generation of toxic people and policies. Those who fear the new world order are the authoritarians, who attack climate, economic, and war refugees in Syria, from US wars in Central America, and throughout the world. I want to um, start to wind down with uh, Lays and Hughes. Um, This poem, which sort of got circulation after Trayvon um, Martin's um, murder. So this is for the kids who died, black and white, for kids will die certainly. The old and rich will live on a while, as always, eating blood and gold, letting kids die. Kids will die in the swamps of Mississippi, organizing sharecroppers. Kids will die in the streets of Chicago, organizing workers. Kids will die in the orange grove of California, telling others to get together. Who gets to live and who is made to die? Who gets to live eating their blood gold and oil, and who <coughs> is made to die too early? Racism, capitalism, militarism, colonialism, land theft of Native people, and gender violence, in short, culture, history, and politics, shape the answer to these questions. Social justice advocates and movements do important ideological work in stripping away the status quo of power relations. Advocates and movements denaturalize the common sense, and in doing so, force a confrontation of the beasts within that seem to devour the many in the source of the few. The tools of American studies, ethnic studies, gender studies, are particularly needed right now to understand the problems we face, in part because of the ideological terrain in which police and revolutionary struggle begins. Focusing on future, freedom, culture, change, and community offers crucial explanation for the predicament identified by revolutionaries and intellectuals. My tempered optimism is structured by experience, analysis, and values of social and environmental justice movements and in my everyday interactions with people, especially the very young and the elders. I have witnessed the prevailing cultural production of ignorance about environmental justice and racism change, sometimes quite suddenly. And I think that that's an important thing to recognize. Things do change. This is the end of the poem. Well, I'll get to that in a second. I, the, the idea of ideology and hegemony, I think, is really um, talked about by Gil Scott Heron in The Revolution Will Not Be Televised. In it, he says, the revolution is the first change in your mind. You have to change your mind before the change the, the, you change the way you live and the way you move. It will just be something that you see and suddenly you realize, I'm on the wrong page, or I'm on the right page, but I'm on the wrong note. And I've got to get into sync with everyone else to understand what's going on. Again, Robin Kelly writes, says something similar. Progressive social movements do not just produce statistics, reports, narratives of oppression. Rather, the best ones do what great poetry does. Transport us to another place, compel us to read with horrors, and more importantly, enable us to imagine a new society. We must remember that the conditions in the existence of social movements enable participants to imagine something different, to realize that things need not be this way. Or to put it another way, the most radical art is not protest, but work that takes us to another place, to envision a different way of seeing perhaps a different way of feeling. Again, the structure of feeling. So, Lace and Hughes, the end of that poem. Listen, kids who die, maybe now there will be no monument for you except in our hearts. Maybe your bodies will be lost in the swamp or in a prison grave or the potter's field or the rivers where you're drowned, like light net. I don't even know what that is. You're a German scholar. Light net. <laughs> but the day will come. You're surely, you're sure yourselves that is coming. When the marching feet of the masses will raise for you a living monument of love and joy and laughter. And black hands and white hands clasped as one in a song that reaches the sky, the song of the life triumphant through the kids who die. So, again, I think the freedom has to be thought of through this condition that we're in. 
Cultural production, creativity, and beauty are necessary to get through the moments of danger we inhabit, the wars without end, the nihilism and the violence, and the end of the planet as we know it. Having clarity and inspiration from those in the struggle and an abiding faith in justice is what will help motivate people, particularly young people, imagine a world different from the one they are inheriting. My hope, my hope is to offer a starting point for those interested in particular struggles and link these together as they have themselves been linked by activists and to spark imagination and hope. What well, links environmental justice, including urban anti-gentrification organizing, uh, Black Lives Matter, water justice, standing rock, just transition, climate justice, are politics and a vision never dominant in the U.S. as an, ex as an exemplar of capitalism, violence, etc., colonialism. This vision for environmental justice is one against eating blood and oil, blood, gold, and oil, and for making work, care, food, energy, and lives matter and not cheap, disposable, and dead. And in doing so echoes the ending of Langston Hughes. Again, the joy, the joy, the laughter, the song of the life triumphant to the kids who died, that's a haunting vision. After uh, Trayvon Martin's uh, murder, this uh, poem recirculated and a reminder of what in some ways has not changed at all. The life triumphant in the death are the lessons of the environmental justice movement, in the struggles of people and communities made vulnerable to violence, and whose continued survival is a direct challenge to the political and economic order addicted to capitalism, carbon, and white supremacy. Our triumph is survival, the choices we make and the stories we tell. Sociologist Daniel Anana Cohen reminds us, quote, every bit of victory is worth winning. That's how I see Gramsci's war of position in the 21st century, carbon trench war. From each dug-in position, the chance for a sudden surge forward. We don't know when that moment comes, but we fight stubbornly until it does, until we're ready. To keep our spirits up, we share stories about flashes of heroism and about long, uncertain living, about liquid dangers and warm pleasures, end quote. This book honors the work, then, of activists who have and continue to be in the struggle. It keeps our spirits up through the sharing of stories, credit, and support. So again, to close up, I want to end this TV. Here is to this, and this is the end of um, Saturn. There's no principles in what you say, um, no direction in the things you do, for your world is soon to come to a close. Through the ages, all great men have been taught, truth and happiness can't just be bought or sold. Tell me why are you people so old? Rather, he wants to go back to Saturn, where all the rings glow, rainbow moonbeams and orange snow on Saturn. People live to be 205. Going back to Saturn where the people smile, don't need cars because we've learned to fly. On Saturn, just to live is our natural high. So here's to the environmental justice activists and believers, Mayor Ranks Bro, who sing, breathe, dance, love, and march in our collective search to make the world not a flint or a standing rock, um, except the good part of the rock, not the oil from the rock, um, but also to make the world Stevie Wonder Saturn. Thank you.
conditions in which all humans can experience forward dreaming. And we can't do that on behalf of and speak in the name of. The work has to be done to enable not only songs to be sung through the body of the child who dies, but the body of the child who's still alive has, has to be given the tools to dream to begin with. So that, but I found that whole construction very moving. Now my question would be, which is, um, how do you think about the university's um, implication in structural, in just, I know it's a delicate but an inevitable question that we do have to, on the one hand we are so able to do the work and speak as you do, and yet how do you reconcile or sit with our inadvertent and at times intentional collusion, even public universities? So, yeah, I don't, yeah, so if you have thoughts about that, it's not, I'm saying you don't have to, you know, justify, just your thoughts about our own situation. Well, we have a lot of responsibility for creating the landscapes of the state. Um, I'll speak specifically about UC Davis, um, which is, you know, the farm. Uh, we made the industrial agricultural landscape, you know, enacted it. And so to do this work from within the belly of the beast, you know, there's a lot of distrust, very valid distrust because of the history of what different faculty and, you know, um, uh, the relationship to big ag and so on, you know. And so we have to have some clarity about what the institution has done historically. Um, and I think that that's really, um, that's a key part is, you know, making transparent and public what our own investments institutionally have been. Um, and so, you know, in that sense, I think that, um, you know, there's a lot of um, pain that the university has inflicted on people. Um, and there has been a lot of um, violence, you know, in, in all forms, you know, including, you know, war industries, nuclear, you know, um, and so on. And so at the same time, you know, I do, uh, you know, believe in the mission, you know, of the public university, but, you know, kind of through that the actual lens of what has happened, you know. And in my class, I teach a small environmental justice class, and we talk about, you know, my view from UC Davis. Like, what does it mean to study this from our position here at Davis? And it's meant to be sort of a creative, it can be not like necessarily a fact-based project, so people do all kinds of, you know, poems or art or whatever. And, you know, there's, there's amazing um, work that comes out of that. Um, and also the way, but the reason I like that assignment is because we also enact violence in terms of how we teach in our pedagogy, you know, and we are invested in, you know, credentializing people and, you know, but that things are complicated and that we exist in contradictory spaces. And so, you know, if, if I was talking about Chang, you know, there's this great book about scholar activism that's um, a few years old, but it's called Engaging Contradictions. You know, and so we have to engage the contradictions all the time, you know, um, but in the university case, I think it's very, um, it's very clear, you know, I mean, you know, the UC is involved in all kinds of NAGPRA struggles, you know, holding native bodies and, you know, and so I think, you know, it's important to us to understand, you know, where we sit, um, literally, like, you know, whose land are we on and so on. Um, but, you know, that, that there is a space sometimes to create, you know, an alternative um, pedagogy, you know, an alternative um, relationships in the classroom, you know, that there is also power, you know, to the idea of um, the public university as a kind of, you know, uh, not, I don't want to say mobility machine, I don't, I don't mean that, you know, but as a place where people can critically, can think critically, you know, in a, in a different way that, you know, Gramsci and, you know, um, and so on are thinking about. And so I think that's where I think the humanities is really important. Um, especially because, you know, there's a lot of pressure for, you know, what is our relevance, you know, how are we proving our worth, and so on, you know. So I think the humanities has a special spot within it, um, the, you know, within the university. Um, and, you know, I, I think that reading, you know, the work of um, Native scholars who talk about, you know, the idea of knowledge capitalism, you know, if we use um, some of these frameworks to, like, think through um, our, our um, where we sit and, and also where we stand, you know, then it can be uh, then it can be a powerful thing. And not the point I always want to say is to not like not to 
bring people to like despair because it's just indulgent to have despair when you know activists have been fighting these things for a really long time. You know what I mean? And so I think part of what you know motivated me to frame it in this way is to say there have been things that have been that have grown. You know, movements have changed discourses. Um, the Sierra Club in the late 90s was very anti-immigrant, like came within a hair's breadth of being taken over by eugenicists. You know, and then they 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 also did a solidarity, solidarity statement with Black Lives Matter just in 2016, which is quite radical. So you know, we also have to take some take into account, you know, that that you know, as much as our critique, you know, it, there's a constancy to it. There are all, there are also things that move, you know, and and we need to show that because otherwise we just get sensible, you know, and that's not that's the disabling part of you know the you know the assaults that are constant.
now appear to be I'm concerned about how much toxin is in my body. When I asked the doctor about it, well, you know, you seem okay, Nance, you're fine. You know, but I don't know. And I have a colleague who teaches about toxicology. So my response is a Native American response. Because in the university, we're focused on the Western tradition. And yet, some of us in the university are not of the Western tradition. So for me, I think about a different kind of power when I hear that word. And in my language, it's DD, which means sacred power. That everything that is alive has this power. Completely different from the Western because it is sacred power. In all the natural world, you have it, you have it, I have it. And what do we do with this? My people have survived for 6,000 years knowing that, knowing their ecosystem thoroughly, because that was their way of sustaining themselves, and recognizing that that sustainability was sacred in nature. So when I teach my students about that, they're literally shocked and don't know what to say. But I continue. I continue. I continue. And I've been here for 40 years doing this. So to me, this is fantastic because it will open the Western consciousness, the mind of Western people. But I also think that what Native American people have to say about this we have suffered tremendous injustice environmentally. They tried to put toxic dumping on our reservation. The women organized and it never happened. But that was community coming together and recognizing that the land is sacred and it cannot provide a place for dumping toxic waste. So I think that your, your appeal to working together is really important and it's very difficult because of racism and because of injustice. And I'm constantly shocked uh, that students are so naive about Native people because they've heard this comparison, they've heard it's from the university, and it's a Western thing, and we were at one time the enemy. So when you see yourself as the enemy, within Western tradition, in which I am trained to be a professor, it's really frustrating, you know, because I know that the institution itself is focused on Western public education, and I totally believe in public education. I did some postdocs at Harvard, and it is elitist. It was very elitist when I was there. And I said, I was offered a job, and I said, no, I'm going back to California. Why? Because it's a public institution, and I believe in public education and educated public. So it was a really interesting experience, and the libraries were fantastic. I spent a lot of time in the libraries. <laughs> but what I'm trying to say is that we need to open up more to what indigenous people are saying about the land, because we're the ones that have been suffering this injustice. Why? asking myself, why? And that's what keeps me going. The other thing that keeps me going is our students, because they're committed to this. They want to know. They don't want to live. They often say to me, I don't want to live like my parents. They're materialistic. You know, I want to simplify. So I really want to thank you for your words. It was very instructional. And I feel like you're my partner in the struggle. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree with everything you've said. And you that actually gets back to another part of the answer to Susan. You see Davis, like I think you see Santa Barbara, as a very strong environmental campus. Um, but environmental means environmental science, and it means neoliberalism. You know, I am shocked at the, at the lack of um, learning that happens in the traditional environmental science classroom. People don't learn about traditional ecological knowledge. They don't learn about environmental justice struggles. And you know, pedagogically, it's completely 
like flawed because environmental justice is like a thing that exists in the in the state and in the activism and in the minds and hearts of people. And so, you know, as an educator, I feel really upset. You know that my one of the students um, in, when they did the My Youth from UC Davis, they he did a revisionist history of papers he wrote that had clear environmental justice components in it that where he was never learned. Like you can learn about Calvin City and just learn about like the quantifiable you know elements of this you know hazardous waste or whatever, but never about the 30 plus year struggle you know against the expansion of the, the facility. And so he did this for his entire curriculum. And yet we graduate about a thousand majors every year who go out into the world. You know, and then and then how are they how are they living as professionals or as as people in the world and not knowing this stuff? Do you know what I mean? And so that's part of where I feel like you know the urgency of the, the position we're in. You know, I think it's really it's a, it's like it's in a form of epistemological violence. Um, and it's violent violence, like actual, in on lands and bodies. Um, but it's also like what, what people don't know about, you know, native histories, myself included, I have to learn much more than I know, you know. Um, and so part of, I mean, I think the, the gift of being, you know, in an institution is that we can keep on learning and, and having these conversations, you know. Um, and that it's really important because, you know, it, these, um, these things exist in the world, and they do harm in the world um, to particular communities and peoples. And that you know, it's it's wrong to have people go through an educational system and not know any of this, especially if you're in environmental studies. You know, but not just environmental studies. Um, and so I think that's you know where I see you know what I, I try to do is to to introduce some things that people a lot of times when I teach people are like, oh, I just didn't know. I never learned this. You know, well, where are we going to learn it? You know, you learn it from people. You learn it in your classroom, ideally. You learn it from others. You learn it from community. You learn it, you know. But it, it's, the, it's that capaciousness and that ability to be humble and to, you know, say, okay, well, you know, I know that I don't know these things, and I need to. And that, that's, a, that's not something that the university does very well. You know, we're all about, like, you know, um, expertise and authority, you know, kind of authority. But I think that, you know, our, our pedagogy should be different. Well, then let's thank Judy and have a reception. Thank you.